The 90s was a decade filled with new technologies, proliferation of the internet, and of course, the dancing baby. It was also a decade that would change the direction of the internet and the bits that backed it forever. Why all this 90s talk? When the first release of CentOS came out in 2004? Well, to truly understand where CentOS came from, we'll need to travel into the fuzzy past of the early 1990s where Red Hat Software Linux, or RHS Linux for short, began. Mark Ewing, the founder of Red Hat, began the work alongside Bob Young to get things going and eventually recruited Damian Neal as a summer intern in 1994 to help with the development of what would soon be named just Preview. Preview was released internally using the RPP package manager. No version number was assigned, but it used the 1.1.18 development kernel. On October 31st, 0 0.9, codenamed Halloween, was released, giving the user a choice between a stable or development kernel. And there was documentation in the box. It also brought with it the Linux Installation Manager, written in Tickle and TK, which allowed graphical installation of packages. But the stable 1.0 release wasn't until May of 95. It was codenamed Mother's Day, even though it wasn't released on that day. Also in 95, the original logo, a red and very tall top hat on top of a serif-marked Red Hat software, was revealed. And just a few months later in September, 2.0 was released without a code name, but it brought with it the first stable release of RPM to handle packaging and began its journey to become one of the two most dominant packaging formats in existence. The 2 series was eventually named Blue Sky. In March of 96, with a release imminent, Bob Young, the then CEO, made the decision to stray from the intended 2.2 release version of Red Hat and bump it up to 3.0.3. .3. It was named Picasso. It also brought with it Glint, the graphical Linux installation tool to act as a graphical front end for RPM. And rumor has it that the release was versioned this way to compete with Slackware's 3.0 released the year prior. And if you want to know how Patrick Volkerding felt about versioning, check out our Slackware episode in Season 2, Episode 19. There was also a new new logo. A yellow background with a man hastily walking to the right, holding onto a red fedora on top of his head. In October, Shadow Man, the iconic obscured face with a red hat circled in black on a light and dark blue spiraled background was introduced alongside 4.0. This release was named Colgate and was the first stable release with a kernel not from the 1. Dot branch, but used the new 2. Dot branch instead. In December of 1997, Red Hat Linux 5.0, named Hurricane, released. It got its name because of a recent hurricane that made landfall near the Red Hat offices and brought in the real audio client and server. Elsewhere in the Linux world, in 1998, Mandrake Linux released its first version named Venice based on Red Hat Linux 5.1. But by 1999, Mandrake had taken on its own identity, leaving its Red Hat dependence behind. In April. Red Hat Linux 6.0, named Hedwig, saw the addition of GNOME 1 and another logo change. Only this time, Shadow Man remained, and the blue background was simply changed to red. The font also changed from serif to sans serif. And with 6.1's release in October, Red Hat began offering a separate support subscription for its enterprise customers. After surviving Y2K, version 6.2, named Zoot, was released in two parts around April of 2000. One part being 6.2e, which came with commercial support, and 6.2, which didn't. In September, Red Hat 7.0, named Guinness, was released and brought with it a mistake. 
Red Hat used a development version of GCC and called it 2.96, even though it wasn't actually released. It wouldn't have been much of a problem until everyone found out that it wouldn't even compile the Linux kernel. After a walk back, some patching, and testing, Red Hat later agreed to rename their version of GCC to 2.96RH. In March of 2002, Red Hat decided to count backwards, but add support. Red Hat Enterprise Linux 2.1, named Pensacola, was released with four variants, Advanced Server, ES, WS, and Desktop. Why not RHEL 1.0? There are rumors that the major version 1 and the minor version 0 was to be avoided, as they both held very negative connotations at the time. The enterprise part of the name brought with it long-term commercial support that was much easier to manage than the rapid-fire releases of Red Hat Linux before it. This started what we know today as RHEL. Sometime within the year, Warren Togami starts the Fedora Linux project. No, not that Fedora. Yet, anyway. It started as a computer science project at the University of Hawaii and aimed to bring together additional packages for Red Hat Linux by consolidating developers and extra packages into one place. But it wasn't a distribution on its own. It was extras for the existing Red Hat Linuxes. In September, Red Hat Linux 8, named Psyche. It released and brought with it Blue Curve, a theme for GTK that permeated most distros. In March of 2003, Red Hat Linux 9, named Shrike, is released. And later, in July, Severn, the beta, which would eventually become Red Hat Linux 10, was released and marked the change from an internal-only type development cycle to a more open and community-focused development process. And in September, Fedora is the future. The Red Hat Linux project announces that it's merging with the Fedora Linux project to create the Fedora project. Now finally, on to the origin of CentOS. So, elsewhere in the world, but also still in September, Greg Kurtzer and Rocky McGaw join up to finally create chaos the Community Assembled Operating System, something that's been in the works since earlier in the year. The idea, at this point, was for Chaos to be a clone of RHEL 2.1, but Greg was opposed to it being just a clone. Rocky suggests building Chaos 1 base, and Greg can make Chaos 1 enhanced, both maintained side by side. One couldn't really exist, without the other. Chaos needed a base, which became CentOS. And the extended suggestion by Rocky is what Chaos eventually became, at least in the beginning. In October, Red Hat Enterprise Linux 3.0, Tarun, based on Red Hat Linux 9, is released. In mid-November, a pre-alpha version of Chaos was being shown to attendees of the Supercomputer Conference in Phoenix, Arizona. It focused on mixing bleeding edge and stability with a long support lifecycle instead of just a RHEL clone. Later in November, Red Hat signals that it's going out of the boxed Linux business and drops a bomb by announcing that Support for Red Hat Linux 7.1.2.3 and 8.0 is over as of December 31st, 2003, giving users just under two months to migrate. 9.0's demise in the same announcement was stretched out to the end of April 2004. As you could imagine, and as with any major change in a Linux distribution, there was a seemingly endless torrent of disagreements with this move. 
But even with the relatively short transition time required, Red Hat started making good on the promise to be more community focused. And what was to be Red Hat Linux 10? Instead, released as Fedora Core 1 with extras. Those extras were Warren Tagami's Fedora Linux project added directly in. And there would be a transition script or package for migration of Red Hat Linux to Fedora Core too. Yeah, and this is about where I enter. So I'm going to talk about that when we get the history done in my experience. I'm going to roll the clock back to here. In December, the first alpha of chaos based on RHEL 2.1 is released to the public. Three weeks later, CentOS 3 Alpha, headed up by Lance Davis, based on RHEL 3, was released. Another week later, on December 30th, CentOS 2 Beta, headed up by John Newbigin, and based on RHEL 2.1, Advanced Server, was also released and was the true public birth of CentOS. The bumpy transition from Red Hat Linux to Red Hat Enterprise Linux was an expensive one, and the CentOS crew were certainly not the only groups around that wanted to debrand and rebuild RHEL for their own purposes. As is the way in Linux, many other projects also began to spring up to provide clones. So I wanted to take a couple minutes to mention them as they mirror much of the landscape we see today in the RHEL clone world. So backing up, a little to November 14th of 2003, we saw the first release candidate for White Box Enterprise Linux, WBEL, based on RHEL 3, backed by the work of John Morris and others. We'll affectionately call it White Box from here. And after a month, White Box 3 was released to the world. In May of 2004, White Box 4, based on RHEL 4, is released. During the next two years, Whitebox 3 and 4 would steadily get updates. Except for the ISP cutover, the major server failure, and a whole lot of life getting in the way between mid-2005 and early 2006. But after that, the respins mostly kept spinning. And in June 2007, John notes that Whitebox 5 is in the works, and respins of Whitebox 3 and 4 are also on the way. Now, Whitebox did get that respin of 4 out as the very last release of Whitebox Linux after Red Hat released some last-minute changes to OpenOffice, but ultimately, though, version 5 never saw the light of day outside of internal development spins, and the promises to continue building respins alongside RHEL of Whitebox 4 never saw the light either. So rewind again to 2003, when David Parsley registered DowLinux.org, and in December, started getting the site together. He makes it clear that the shortened lifespan of the previous Red Hat Linux products, as well as the changeover to Fedora with a much faster cadence, wasn't going to cut it. David wanted RHEL for the long-term support, and instead of using UpToDate as the Red Hat products used, he could slip in YUM to manage updates. It turns out that the project really had its origins during the RHEL 2.1 lifecycle, as David used it internally at his workplace. Now, in the public, the first official release was DAO Linux Release 1, based on RHEL 3, on December 16th of 2003. After Release 1, the versioning changed to match RHEL and made things a little easier to understand ahead of the release of DAO Linux 4 in April of 2005. Over the next year, updates kept flowing, but in June of 2006, David had to switch jobs, and that meant no more work time used for Dow, and his priority was his family. So instead of letting Dow and its users suffer, plans were laid to fold Dow into CentOS so folks could continue enjoying a RHEL clone without much work. One update and a simple change in a YUM configuration, and it's mostly done. Back again to 2003 for the last time, we hit the longest running of the three clones. Up until now, there were many physics and science labs that were using heavily customized Linux boxes to run the software they needed, but sharing software and information 
as always happens in science, was made extremely difficult because of differences in things like glibc, RPM versus DEB, and other dependency issues. But in 2003, the distribution Fermilab and CERN were using was discontinued, and the road to choosing a new one began. Red Hat Enterprise Linux wasn't an easy choice for either lab, but the long support lifecycle, stability, and security was enticing. Scientific Linux, based on RHEL, was announced at HEPIX in late 2003 by Fermilab, and CERN soon joined. And in May of 2004, Scientific Linux 3.0.1, based on RHEL 3, named Lithium, was released. While Scientific Linux doesn't make new releases today, its only living RHEL descendant is Scientific Linux 7, which will see its support end in 2024 when RHEL 7 goes end of life. So, back to CentOS and its brother Chaos. While Chaos 1, the proof of concept, was intended to be finished and released at the end of 2003, it wasn't until February of 2004 that the final release made it to mirrors. It was based on RHEL 2.1. But CentOS kept moving right along, and in March, CentOS 3.1 is released based on RHEL 3. In April, CentOS 2 released as expected. A few months later, CentOS 3.3 released based on the third update from Red Hat, and according to Karanbir Singh, known simply as KB around the development circles, was a contributor at the time. He noted that 3.3 was the first proper release. The target was 100 downloads. They got 500. In January of 2005, after Red Hat dropped update 4, CentOS 3.4 was released. And KB noted that if the clone got 2,000 downloads, it would be a sign of success. The count quickly rose to 15,000. It was at this point that the folks involved knew CentOS was going to be big. It obviously filled a niche. In February, CentOS received a cease and desist letter from the lawyers over at Red Hat in regards to using the Red Hat logos and name on the CentOS.org website. The letter required the CentOS team to scrub any markings from any and all of their pages so as to avoid any type of accidental affiliation. CentOS's response gave off very he-who-shall-not-be-named vibes as they referred to Red Hat as prominent North American enterprise Linux vendor. In March, CentOS 4 was released two weeks after its upstream RHEL 4, and this seemed to be a turning point where news outlets really started picking up the steam on coverage for the clone. Shortly after, Lance Davis announces that CentOS is separating itself from the Chaos Project. This caused a lot of concern in the community and was the first time since its inception that CentOS was at risk of losing its user base. In May, Chaos 2 is announced and based on RHEL 3. In March of 2007, RHEL 5 is released with YUM instead of up to date that was used up until this release. And in April, CentOS 5 followed. Then in May, Fedora Core and Fedora Extras merge bringing together the two pieces that make Fedora what it is today. In 2008, while development for Chaos 2 was cooling down, a new distribution, also called Chaos but with a different capitalization, was released by the same group. It was called Chaos NSA. Its focus was for high-performance servers, compute nodes, and appliances. February 25th of 2009, Chaos NSA drops the NSA and simply becomes Chaos Linux. And in July, Lance Davis, one of the founders and lead of the CentOS 2 release, had been missing for many months. And at this point, the community banded together to write an open letter to request his return so that continuity can be established. It was signed by prominent CentOS figures like Russ Harold, Jim Perrin, and Johnny Hughes. 
And on August 1st, Lance Davis surrendered the domain and other assets to the project at large. This was another point that brought CentOS to the brink of destruction. On October 14th, Chaos Linux 1.0.25 is released and is the last release of Chaos ever. Long live CentOS. In November of 2010, RHEL was, up until this point, on a two-ish year release cadence and managed to miss that window for RHEL 6 by almost an additional two years. And normally, that wouldn't be a problem for CentOS. But infighting and miscommunication put the release, not weeks, but months out. Of course, the Lance Davis debacle didn't help things. Not only that, but Red Hat changed their kernel packages and patches from being fully open to a single kernel source package making troubleshooting downstream in clones like CentOS almost impossible. And in July of 2011, CentOS 6 is released after an eight-month struggle to get it out the door. When questions began to arise in February of that year, the CentOS team claimed that CentOS 6 was about 30 packages away from release, insinuating that the release was fairly imminent. However, as we see, that didn't quite pan out. This, combined with the mixed messaging and overall lack of communication, caused the users of the clone to again threaten to leave. And some surely did. But we wouldn't be doing a CentOS history if CentOS had not soldiered on. Fast forward to January of 2014. Red Hat acquires CentOS, and longtime developers like Jim Perrin, KB, and Johnny Hughes, to name a few. And again, the user base of CentOS is in an uproar. More threats to leave, and more did. In July, CentOS 7 is released. After the uproar from 2014 settled, we fast forward again to 2019, which saw a string of shakeups. The first of these being Red Hat leaving Shadow Man behind in May. He was replaced with a simple red fedora with a black band. Then, in September, Red Hat announces CentOS Stream. The announcement was absolutely not well received, <laughs> except for a select few. And it was a rocky start. And confusion was everywhere. With reports of it being called CentOS Streams and references to a rolling release adding to the confusion. But one good thing would certainly come of the change. Contributors to CentOS are now also de facto contributors to Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Non-Red Hat subscribers can now contribute, whereas before, the recommendation from Red Hat themselves was to file a bug report. But to do that, you needed to be a paid subscriber to get access to the bug reporting systems. At some point during this transition, CentOS quietly became CentOS Linux for future releases, likely to differentiate the two distributions. CentOS Linux, of course, being the original downstream RHEL clone, and CentOS Stream living slightly upstream of RHEL. Later in September, CentOS Linux 8 and CentOS Stream 8 are released. And by looking at the dates, we can see that CentOS Linux 8 was ready for quite some time before it was actually released, which isn't normal in any of the previous cases of CentOS, nor was it the case after. There was certainly some amount of lineup between CentOS 8 and CentOS 8 Stream's release. To compound the release announcement's confusion, there was no official end-of-life date noted for CentOS Linux 8. However, astute community members posted what it should be, based on previous lifecycles, on an official CentOS webpage. 
after Red Hat learned about this, they quickly went into damage control mode because the unreleased end of life date was really December 31st of 2021, much to the chagrin of CentOS 8 users. This was much shorter than the noted and normal 10 years of support. And this again conjured the pitchforks. The user base was not happy. January 2021. Red Hat changes the way their dev subscriptions work. Prior to this, free options were available, but not really enough to do much work with. However, now, 16 RHEL licenses can be had for development environments for free. The program which was slated to plug holes felt when CentOS 8's demise was imminent still wouldn't be released until the 1st of February. Still in January, Brian Exelbeard, a CentOS board member, said in an interview with the Register that the CentOS board at large did not have any say in what happened with CentOS 8 and the transition to CentOS 8 stream. New clones, now that CentOS would no longer live in that role, cropped up. Project Linux, later renamed to Alma Linux, with Alma meaning soul, stepped up with a release in March based on RHEL 8.3 and backed by Cloud Linux. They continue maintenance to this day. Another of the clones came in June, called Rocky Linux. The name honors the late Rocky Maga. Theirs was based on RHEL 8.4 and is also actively maintained and backed by a self imposed not for profit. 2022 CentOS 9 Stream is released with an expected end of life in 2027 and is what we have been running the entire month. As far as we can tell, there wasn't much drama surrounding this release. And looking ahead, in 2024, we'll see CentOS 10 stream, which is obviously not out yet, and if trends hold, will likely be based on Fedora 40. And again, assuming an end-of-life date sometime in 2029.